Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Fifth Estate at the Wheeler Centre. Uh, my name is Sally Warhaft, and uh, it's a pleasure tonight to have um, these two very esteemed guests to talk about Australian defence, foreign policy, um, and security in, well, the age of ISIS. Professor Greg Barton is from the School of Politics and Social Inquiry at Monash University and the Director of the Centre for Islam and the Modern World. He's also active in the Global Terrorism Research Centre and all sorts of other places. I could go on and on about Greg's uh, list of affiliations and achievements. His particular interests um, in, in research have always been around interfaith dialogue and uh, security and counter-terrorism. He's been broadly published in academia as well, of course, in our newspapers and uh, I'm sure you've all heard him plenty of times on the radio as well. And sitting next to Greg is James Brown. He served as an officer in the Australian Army prior to being pinched by the Lowy Institute and uh, he has actually commanded a cavalry troop in southern Iraq. He's served in Baghdad and in the special forces in Afghanistan. He's now the military fellow at the Lowy Institute and the author of this little book, Anzac's Long Shadow, which um, I urge you all to go out and get and read it if you haven't already, a really a truly uh, unique take on Anzac, uh, on the legend of Anzac Day, from somebody who's actually been to war. And uh, one of the things in this entire, you know, in the, the subject of tonight, but also reflecting on the anniversary, the 100 years of World War I and so on, is that you don't actually meet many soldiers in Australia in day-to-day -day life. So we're very grateful for you to uh, making the time tonight. Please welcome Greg and James. Um, I want to begin by asking you both to just reflect on what kind of a battle it is we are waging with ISIS because um, they seem to appear kind of out of nowhere. One, one day there wasn't such a thing as the Islamic State and then there just seemed to be. Is it a, um, a modern sort of version of an ancient kind of battle before we had things called nation states? Uh, or is it a very new kind of battle that we've never seen before? Uh, perhaps, Greg, you can go first. Well, I think if you asked Islamic State, they would claim to be ancient in the sense of being pure, back to the first generation of the Prophet's time, uh, which is what fundamentalists do of all persuasions. Actually, it's very, very modern. Uh, their ideology comes from the late 20th century and has developed, of course, in this century. Uh, this is the, the modern manifestation of al-Qaeda. It's, it's, it's the latest evolution of the al-Qaeda narrative. So we're going back at least a quarter of a century, back to when we walked out of Afghanistan, the Taliban rose, and al-Qaeda found a space. And, of course, uh, more recently after the occupation of, of Iraq beginning 2003 when al-Qaeda in Iraq formed in 2004. They are obsessed with the idea of having their own nation state, hence their name, uh, and that's a very modern obsession. Uh, we might think that this Sunni on Shia and, and, and uh, uh, fundamentalist Sunni position is, is ancient. It's not. It's a very modern obsession. Uh, but it's both now an occupying force and a quasi-state but also a global insurgency, because it is Al-Qaeda 25 years on, and uh, it comes into our suburbs, uh, it, you know, attacks our families, draws our young people out. Uh, it's a battle for hearts and minds, it's a battle of ideas, so it's, it's a military battle on the ground, but it's not something we can just leave over there, because it's, it's now affecting the entire world. Mm. I, and, and I think, you know, one thing I absolutely agree on with Greg, and, and I agree with what we said, but particularly is the fact that this is an evolution. Uh, and in a lot of the rhetoric that we've seen political leaders use to describe ISIS. This is a death cult. They're pure evil. It makes it sound sort of very primal, but also very new. Um, this is an evolution of techniques, tactics and strategies developed in the fight in, uh, against the US and others over the last decade. Um, I think the best way to think about these groups sometimes is as a business. 
Um, it's a branding exercise. Uh, sure, they they fight in tanks and they move artillery around and they fight like a conventional army. Sure, they do all those horrific things that we associate with various insurgent and terrorist groups. But what really give these, gives these guys kick and appeal and effectiveness is the brand that gets money and fighters in the door. Mm. What are they trying to achieve? Well, in the first instance, they've they've achieved their aim. They've got a they've got a state. They've got and it's very, uh, um, you know, it's a very evocative thought that they control the northern reaches of the Euphrates and the Tigris, Mesopotamia. So they have that territory, home to eight million people at the moment, who are hostage under their police state. Um, eventually, they'll be driven out. But it's going to be hard. But what they want to use is that, is, is that as a base for projecting their vision outwards. Uh, the name Al-Qaeda means the base, and it was always envisaged that eventually um, they would have a, a, their own state, but in the meantime, there would be a base for a, a global struggle. And this manifestation of Al-Qaeda, even though it's fallen out with Al-Qaeda core leadership, um, both wants to continue to occupy this territory, expand it a little bit, perhaps pick up an archipelago of little mini caliphates that'll swear allegiance to them, and have an influence globally. If you look at their, you know, their, their rhetoric, they talk about global domination. I don't think they really believe that, but they know that they can influence sort of every city on the planet one way or another. And so they know that they are also in the business of, of marketing, as, as James said, it's strong brand and, and propaganda, but persuasion, um, emotional persuasion, very slick video productions, very slick use of social media. And they want to have that dominant position. They want to be the, do the, the dominant other uh, contesting not just the West but, but, but everything else that they see as their enemy. I've been sort of wondering why now. Um, some of the tactics that they've employed, uh, I, I sort of expected really much sooner after 9-11 that uh, it would be that, that, that kind of smaller target, I suppose, uh, fear in, in the branding out to the... West. And I think, James, it was something you wrote um, recently about, you know, straight out of the Al-Qaeda uh, textbook of, of, of uh, you know, uh, killing the bakers and the garbage disposal uh, workers was an Al-Qaeda tactic very, very early on because if people didn't have their rubbish removed and their daily bread, they would be more likely to get on side or to... To, to, to be in the dysfunction of sort of daily life. Is there anything specific about it being now? I Look, I, I don't know the answer to that question, so I'm speculating here. Um, why now? I would imagine that there was a period of time after the US and everybody left where these groups really had to shake themselves out to give some of the local power structures in some of those provinces in the northwest time to work for resentment to, to build for um, the kind of uh, purges, particularly of the Iraqi security force leadership in, in the north that um, the former Prime Minister of Iraq undertook to take place. So it's that sort of cauldron of things happening and bubbling away. So that's the best guess as to why I think it's, it's sort of taken until now. Um, opportunity, the development, the way the Syria conflict has developed and the sort of lawlessness of, the, of eastern Syria again. So all of those things being thrown into the mix. Mm. Yeah, I think opportunity is a key thing there. Um, this is this is a dream fulfilled that goes back to the 80s when Al Qaeda was was forming in Afghanistan, but they didn't have the capacity. They never quite achieved their vision in Afghanistan of being welcomed. They were actually very bad house guests. So uh, the Afghanis weren't even the Taliban particularly fond of them on their ongoing presence. They never had a real uh, state base there. Uh, they succeeded with 9-11 in provoking an angry response. That was the intention of 9-11. We went into Afghanistan. We got the bonus of going, from their point of view, into Iraq, which they hadn't anticipated, although uh, Musab al-Zakawi, a Jordanian, who started at AQI in 2004, was back in time for the, the occupation. He saw that coming. Um, and then they reaped the benefits of that. But Zakawi, who had the habit of doing video blogs, gave away his location too freely, was met with a F-16 and a 500-pound bomb in 2006, and, and that set them back. Then the troop surge of 2007, that really succeeded working together with the Sunni leaders of the West and the North. Uh, that greatly limited what uh, AQI could do. But then we pulled out the end of 2011. The civil war in Syria took off. Uh, we saw this unassuming guy we thought nothing of who went by the, the nom de guerre of Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. Turns out he's a, quite a brilliant, quite charismatic, uh, certainly very good strategician 
quite a brilliant leader, and, and he saw an opportunity in Syria, drew in foreign fighters, something he couldn't do so well in Iraq, and then came back into Iraq. Mm -hmm. So it was you know, opportunity, and, and when he had the capacity, he's now got the capacity to do what was a vision 25 years ago. Before we turn to Australia's involvement um, in, in all of this, what do you make so far, of, well, particularly Obama's response, the US response, because that's the one that really, really matters the most? James? Well, we, we know that um, Obama was embarrassed when he set red lines for Syria, he said, don't do this, do not cross this line or we will respond, and then he didn't respond. Um, we know that he was under a lot of domestic pressure to do something this time, um, very reluctant. I mean, don't forget, this is the president who has agonised over the, the transition in Afghanistan, who's sort of gone through the sacking of generals, uh, sacked McChrystal in Afghanistan. He's sort of had all these issues with being in wars that he didn't initially choose to get into, so very reluctant to go back. Um, and we've now got this sort of halfway solution where uh, we've already set out what it is we won't do. We're not going to put boots on the ground. We're not going to have a large ground force. We're not going to use all the tools at our disposal. Um, so it, it's sort of an imperfect strategy. Uh, it, it's uh, how it will play out, we'll see, but the initial signs aren't great. Well, it's a strategy, uh, I mean, Australia seems to have, have followed. Uh, in lockstep. But the coalition, I mean, there, it's not just Australia and America, there's, I think, 60 uh, other countries that are involved one way or another, including, of course, Arab countries. Uh, how much harmony is there on the objectives, even, of, with this coalition? Well, I mean, I mean, amongst 60 countries, not much, right? I mean, it's, and it's a very broad group. Uh, everyone from countries who... Um, not that long ago, we're funneling a lot of money to some of these groups through to countries like Australia and Canada. Um, and, and Australia is actually out in front on this. I mean, unashamedly out, on, out in front. We wanted to uh, not shame, I don't, I don't think, but sort of um, help urge the US to respond to this problem. That was a deliberate strategy of the Australian government. Um, wielding big coalitions like this is difficult. Uh, really, And just some of the most practical steps, different rules of engagement, uh, different logistical arrangements, sharing intelligence, getting on the same computer system. Uh, and the US has had some experience at doing that in the last 10 years, but it's still very tough. Mm. Greg? Well, we haven't seen clear leadership from Washington, and there's good reasons for that. And I think you know, that we should speak to some extent in, in President Obama's defence. Um, of course, when he was senator in Illinois, he, he voted against going into Iraq, and I think many people would say that was the correct decision then. Uh, when he came into the, to the White House, he gave that wonderful speech at Cairo University. He really did want to engage with the region. He's had a very hard run of it, both at home with Congress and, and uh, in the region. Uh, the Arab Spring has gone very badly, to say the least. I mean, the worst manifestation of what's happening now in, in Syria, which is just a, a living nightmare. Uh, he was reluctant to get involved in the no-fly zone uh, intervention with uh, with Libya. I think he's been proved that reluctance has been proven well based. I mean, Libya is is teetering on the verge of complete chaos now, and, and so when he looked at Syria, and he's a very intellectual president, and that makes him a sort of lightly awkward, bookish leader. He said, "There's no good options. There really are no good options." So when he was asked uh, six weeks ago, "What is your strategy for Syria?" he said, "We haven't got one." yet. I mean, that was what he was saying. And that's a very honest response. And then mm. a similar honest response um, a month ago when he was interviewed on 60 Minutes, and he said, we underestimated al-Qaeda. We didn't say that we underestimated uh, ISIS, but, you know, the whole al-Qaeda thing. We, we didn't see this coming. We should have seen it coming. He was talking about that final intelligence uh, product, that final analysis, once again being very candid. And, you know, back in February, he said, this is a college B-grade team. We don't have to worry about them too much. And he was saying, you know, last month, actually, that was wrong. These are, are much more serious. So he's been struggling with a very fast-evolving situation we all have, and he's been very honest about it, and he's come reluctantly to lead this coalition. One of the remarkable things is that um, likeable but rather clumsy, goofy guy, Secretary of State John Kerry, has had remarkable success in putting together a coalition. And the fact we've got the Saudis working with the Emiratis and, the, and, the, and the, uh, the Qatar and... Uh, shortly it looks like Turkey coming on board and, and all the others, along with Western nations, actually is quite a breakthrough. And it's actually one of the, I think, few signs of good news in this 
this very uh, this dark period um, because everyone's I mean everyone involved in the coalition has made mistakes in this region all of us and uh, we I think collectively realize we've got to this this won't go away by itself we've got to do something and and there is this desire to try and find a solution um, there were some very wise words uh, the other week from the um, Emir of Dubai the uh, the uh, Prime Minister of the Emirates uh, Al Maktoum when he said this needs a military solution, but it needs a political solution, it needs good governance, it needs a human development, it needs a response to the ideas. And I think he was speaking for uh, an evolving awareness in the Middle East that actually this is a big problem. Even Iran, which has played with Saudi, against Saudi Arabia in a proxy war uh, in Iraq and Syria, now recognises this is a monster that's gone too far. And I think your point about, mm. you know, Obama being jumped on for mm. saying we don't have a strategy, it's, it's a great one. I mean, mm. none, nothing is, there's no perfect strategy here. It's going to be messy whichever way you look at it, mm. right? It's curious, though, isn't it, that a, a, it's a coalition that, you know, as you mean, in, includes Saudi Arabia, who have lopped off so many more heads than ISIS ever had. Uh, women for infidelity. I mean, you know, they're, they're uh, in, in the name of their state. Uh, so you've got, you've got partners like that in Iran, formerly in the axis of evil. Uh, and then, you know, as you said, places like Australia on the other. How do you... I mean, America could have actually, for all John Kerry's great work, mm. just gone in on its own. It would have been probably a lot simpler than having all these uh, countries working together. It's very odd because it's... I mean, the imagery of the beheadings especially, I think, has has forced... Uh, there's, something, there's something about the way ISIS have done this that has commanded um, a, a, a response, but... So let, let, let's play alternate history. I mean, let's say ISIS had come up um, in June earlier this year. The US had decided the correct response here is to attack ISIS while they're acting like a conventional army. So while they're driving around in their tanks and vehicles, um, let's land some US forces unilaterally because we can move quickly. We've got 4,000 troops and armoured vehicles that we could fly into Erbil and drive down the road. Um, that could have been effective. Uh, or we might be sitting here saying, "There they go, they've done America it again." America have done it yeah, again. You know, mm. they're, they're playing, they're playing with other people's fates, mm. and there might be fifty dead Americans from IED strikes on their vehicles. So, yeah, it's not. So, what about Australia's response? You just mentioned before that we were so quick. Tony Abbott was so quick uh, to to determine his course of action. Uh, for the Australian military, was that wise? I don't know yet. Um, the initial sign... I mean, Australia is in an interesting position. We're there because there is a genuine threat to us here, um, because we have a shared interest in maintaining global order, um, you know, in making sure that the, the way the world works that affords us a degree of prosperity and freedom we can support. Um, we do have a genuine interest in supporting the US uh, and, and making sure they stay engaged in the world. The strategy of getting out there quite vocally, if based on what I've seen, I don't think it's had quite the influence we expected. I mean, Tony, this is not sort of a whim for Tony Abbott. When he visited the US and went to see Obama in the Oval Office, the first thing he said is, how can we help? So he wants to be an ally that's not free riding on the US. Um, but when you look at the sort of reporting on the conflict in the US, I don't think you'd say that Australia is sort of uh, more valued in the coalition than some of the other countries involved. So it's a delicate balance for us. We've got to make sure we don't overcommit. I think we've overcommitted a little bit with the special forces that we've put in. Sending very expensive aeroplanes um, and, and the people that fly them over there, I mean, it's an incredibly expensive way to lend uh, support over the other side of the world? Was it the right approach, do you think, Greg? Well, let me sort of context this by saying I think 2003 was disastrous. It was the wrong idea to go in and it was done in the wrong way. Uh, but I do support what we're doing now. And, and I think part of what the reason for Australia is responding in the way that it has was there was this need to have an international coalition, including regional Arab and, 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 and Turkish uh, presence. Uh, it wouldn't have happened without America leading. To help America lead off and to get a coalition together, I think, I think the Prime Minister's thinking was this, our going forward would help in that coalition formation process. Uh, 
This needs ultimately political solutions that are national, Syria, Iraq, but also regional with international support. So if it was just an American operation, it wouldn't work at that level of, of politics. You need this coalition. Um, in terms of what we can offer, offering the F-18s uh, is something that's necessary and practical. Um, what our special forces guys do, uh, I guess, I mean, James is right, we'll, we won't know how to judge us for some time to come. Um, but strangely enough, I think the Prime Minister's instincts on this were right. I mean, he's clumsy with his messaging, but I think he was right to recognise this is something that has a direct impact on our interests. And also, frankly, there's a moral responsibility here. You know, as they say in the shop, if you break it, you own it. And, and we did help, not, not out of malice, not out of uh, any desire, but to do the right thing. We ended up um, being part of a coalition that engaged in debuffification, breaking up the Iraqi military, creating perfect storm conditions for an insurgency in which al-Qaeda came in and dominated, a very strange way to response to this uh, major al-Qaeda attack in September 11. Uh, but, you know, we went into that blindly. And I think we have a responsibility to see this through. I don't think we can walk away from this. Um, the mistake with Afghanistan in the 80s was when that was over, to walk away and, and not be involved in the reconstruction of Afghanistan. And I think, I think there's some sort of residual sense that we've got to be back and see this through, even though it's... Um, I mean, if you could run time again, you, would, you wouldn't go there in the first place. You wouldn't be back here. You don't think there was an opportunity this time for a, a change of course and, and, and for a Prime Minister in Australia to stand up and say, you know, yes, we were there uh, back then, but we feel our priority now is in the region and so as part of the coalition, rather than going directly in with symbolic hornets, really. I mean, mm. those planes are not going to make or break any kind of a, a solution to, to the ISIS threat, uh, that we're going to put a similar equivalent of, of resources, of money, into Indonesia, into, you know, redoubling our efforts in our, in our region. Is it not politically possible to do that anymore, both with foreign policy relations but also at home? It's possible, and I'm sure we would have considered it, and well, I hope we considered it, whether we could sort of say, you guys take that, we'll focus on the region. Um, I, I would disagree on the point about the Hornets. I mean, it's not an entirely symbolic contribution. The fact that we have, a, a, you know, a, and this is getting quite military technical, but we have fighter jets, a refueler and a surveillance plane that can all work together. That's pretty sophisticated and pretty valuable within the coalition. Um, it, it does offer, um, offer utility. But I guess, you know, you're sort of saying, do we need to break this pattern of making symbolic deployments in, in terms of doing something more meaningful? What makes that really hard to judge is if you look for a statement of Australia's national interests in this region, there isn't one that's clearly accessible to the public. So if you're sitting there as a, as a policymaker or a strategist trying to determine are we satisfying Australian national objectives as well as Australian alliance objectives, it's really hard to be clear on whether those two are married up. Um, I think as, you know, we're a rich country but we have a small military and it does put pressure on our commitment in the region um, by deploying this many forces. As an example, uh, Australia has probably about seven subunits of special forces that it can deploy anywhere. Two of those are tied up on counter-terrorism taskings in Australia, and we've just deployed two overseas. That leaves three behind. Now, that means we can't afford to keep that rotation going overseas indefinitely. It certainly means that we can't respond um, to other contingencies locally. So we, we do have a really tough time balancing the pressures of, of both regions at once. So does it actually leave us vulnerable if there was a, an incident here? No. I mean, I think if we have a terrorist incident here, we've got enough to, to rely on it. But if, for example, we needed to start pulling Australians out of somewhere in the South Pacific or somewhere in Southeast Asia, um, it would put pressure on the ability of our special forces to respond to that. Do you think... Um, I mean, I'll, I'll ask you both about the, the, the laws that have gone along with this too, because the, the, the messaging so far... Um, I mean, you've just said that there hasn't been a case made other than a very sort of very blunt... It's been, uh, you know, we're, 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 we're here for you to the US straight away. Uh, we've sent these 
special forces and hornets, and now we're obviously overhauling our anti-terror <coughs> laws. How does that fit into this, and does it make sense as a, as a whole strategic policy of defence? Greg. Look, I think it, 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 I mean, James is right, we'll have to wait before we can really make, have final judgment on this, but I think it does make sense, but it's, it's, a, it's a very debatable point, and because we, you know, this isn't a token commitment, as James has said, this is um, about as much as we commit, can commit and, and sustain year on year, and this, this may be two, three, four years, and if we stay the course, uh, we can't be, you know, we can't easily carry more than we've, we've offered, and it's actually quite substantial. You know, those F-18s fit in very well with the same aircraft the US is operating. We've got our own um, uh, 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 electronics, um, uh, early warning aircraft, and refueling aircraft. So we're, we're making a, we're sort of carrying our own weight and making a useful contribution. And the special forces guys also will make a very significant comp contribution. There would probably be more consistency in the sort of general thinking about what we're doing if we also went into West Africa in a limited way and, and helped with that, because it's the same kind of situation. There is a global problem. It's really big. It's not going to fix itself. Uh, the regional powers can't solve it by themselves. We need to lend, lend international help. And I think the Prime Minister probably, you know, he, I guess, operates on instinct, and his instincts, I think, were sound in, in, in recognising we needed to help get a coalition going with this, and I, I would argue probably we also need to be involved in West Africa on the Ebola crisis. Um, but it's that kind of not so much direct threat. There's a direct threat in terms of Islamic State recruiting here and the global threat of terrorism. We're certainly part of that threat. Um, but it's more just, you know, are we a global citizen? Are we going to play a role? Well, yeah, OK, we've, we've, this is something we can do and should do. And, and to be fair to Tony Abbott, I mean, these are big crises that he's dealing with early in his term. You know, I mean, sort of Howard had a bit more of a grace period in terms of... Uh, his term, Rudd and Gillard sort of had a bit more of a grace period as well in terms of having to deal with big international security crises. And here's three or four, including Ukraine, that have had to be dealt with um, early on. And it's difficult for Australia to find its level. Where should we be involved as a good global citizen? Where shouldn't we be involved? I mean, um, Ukraine, uh, Australian military support to Ukraine? Absolutely not. That was an overreach. Mm -hmm. um, so finding that level is really tricky. It's tough to do. Yeah, you don't. I mean, you, I can see being a prime minister needs some instinct, obviously, but not too much. <laughs> well, we also need to, and like for anyone in that situation, you've got to transition from being a very effective um, leader of the opposition to being prime minister, and, and you know that, that transition takes time. Um, and, and there's some signs that it's not. It seems to take longer completed. and longer and longer with each passing. But to be, to be fair, I mean, this is this is a series of crises that yes. would test any new prime minister, and. Uh, and uh, you don't always calibrate, you, know, you don't get the calibration right in your first response. And, and to your question about, you know, the, the terrorism laws and the sort of legislative things happening through, I mean, if IS had never raised its head this year, I think we would still be having this debate about right. um, expanded powers for the intelligence agencies. And my view on that, um, there, was a, there was definitely a need to update some of the restrictions they were dealing with, particularly in terms of monitoring cyber, telecommunications, the models they were operating under were pretty outdated. So that definitely needed to happen. Um, but I really have concerns about the culture of secrecy and the lack of transparency um, that surrounds the national security community in Australia, not just ASIO and the other intelligence agencies, but defence as well. And at this point, I wouldn't be comfortable with the journalist um, mm. sort of suppressions, the sort of... Oh, it's um, disgraceful. ..the moves that will mm. impact on whistleblowers... Um, I'm having my own difficulties in terms of trying to extract publicly information that should be publicly available from security agencies. Um, we're not ready to give uh, more powers in that direction. Mm. Uh, David Irvine, who just last month uh, retired from his post as the ASIO uh, Director General, uh, was very honest and, and I thought measured in his... Uh, remarks about really struggling with whether or not the threat level in Australia should go up. Um, he's now left and there's a, a new guy, Duncan Lewis, is the, the new chief. He's a former Special Forces chief. How much um, 
How much rests on the person? You know, we know what rests on who the Prime Minister is, but what about the Director General of Asia? How much difference does, does it make that you have an, a, a new person in that role? I wish I knew. Um, <laughs> I've never been Director General of ASIO, thankfully, but... Um, well, at least you can't talk about it anyway. Yeah, yeah that's right. So, <laughs> apart from that uni job I had. That's in uh, your career. Yeah. That's, easy, that's not <laughs> mentioned. Uh, yeah. um, but uh, Duncan Lewis... Uh, Duncan Lewis is, is quite a unique character in that he is highly respected on the military side, um, but also highly respected by civilian bureaucrats as well. Um, he has a lot of respect in the parliament. Um, so I think in terms of dealing with this threat, which is sometimes a military threat, sometimes a civilian threat, uh, often crossing the borders between military and policing, he's pretty well equipped to do that. Um, you know, he, he ran the Department of Defence for a little while before uh, he had some difficulties and he was quite a straight shooter um, when, he, when he ran that Department of Defence and he was quite principled. So I think he'll do well in the role. I think James's point about um, the, the need for more transparency is, is really key because I think um, in, in, in counter-terrorism generally, one of the most important elements is intelligence and, and one of the most important elements of intelligence is human intelligence and in practical terms that really involves good community engagement and, and really trust from communities, people speaking up when they, they have concerns. That's served us well in the past. But in talking about reforming legislation, uh, I think David Irvine gave as good as he could give under existing legislation and uh, I, I don't doubt that it'll be true of Duncan Lewis as well. We're, we're well served by these individuals, but it's not fair that so much depends on the individual character. Our legislation should make it easier for leaders of our agencies to engage the public. And at the moment, we basically, very, you know, there's two guys in ASIO that can tell you where they go to work in the morning. The others mm -hmm. just work in some unnamed branch of the Attorney General's department. And that's not a good way of building confidence in public. Um, the fact we've got these, uh, very punitive restrictions on media reporting. It's, it's just, it's counter to everyone's interests, including the intelligence community. It doesn't help. Yeah, yeah. and presumably too with, um, I mean, the, I, I imagine the, a major, if not the major source of domestic intelligence is, in fact, Muslim communities in Australia. And uh, we hear time and time again, or I do at any rate, people criticising uh, Muslim community leaders for not standing up and saying... I mean, I, it's all I ever seem to hear is them coming out and saying, you know, what needs to be said time and time again, uh, but also that um, many individuals and families presumably have made the decision to pass on intelligence. We're not... We're not we don't hear about that either, do we? No, and, and we, you know, the great bogeyman at the moment, if you ask many people in, in, in community groups um, about their anxieties, and people are feeling very anxious, very hard-pressed from all sides. Their kids mm. are at risk of being taken away by these nefarious uh, recruiters. Um, they get criticised within the community, with outside the community. The press is asking them why they don't speak up, and then they make a statement that doesn't get reported on. So they're feeling hard done by. But the great bogeyman at the moment is this thing called ASIO, which uh, can't talk about itself apart from the Director-General, uh, when we heard David Irvine in recent months speak about his, you know, when, when he was in that post, it was very helpful. He went out of his way to engage the community, spoke to the Muslim media. Uh, if mid-level ASIO managers could do that, it could probably overcome a lot of the current mistrust because at the moment no one really knows what's happening on the ground in, in the suburbs. Um, it makes it hard for state police and federal police as well. We just need to have a, a degree of more open conversation about what's going on and, and, and what the concerns are in the manner we've seen from the former uh, Director General. Uh, in America, I think it's true in, in the UK and Germany and other comparable countries, um, the CIA or the FBI or, or, uh, or the uh, intelligence agencies can speak more openly about what they're doing and, and there's more understanding of why they have to do what they do. But we, we have bound our agencies with uh, legislation that, that prohibits them speaking up. I mean. Uh, it's just not a healthy environment. We do need, I think, reforms in counterterrorism legislation. It's very hard to do what needs to be done, but it also needs to be accompanied by trust-building uh, exercises that, you know, we, we've got to work on these things together. And it's hard to do that when, when half of the people involved can't speak about what they're doing. And, and there are a couple of other factors here just to throw into the mix, but we do have this real... I mean, it's a really vexing problem, this culture of secrecy around um, national security. 
Uh, two other things. One is the disproportionate ability of politicians to shut down debate because it might be embarrassing or to prevent the restriction of information. Even sometimes by just setting a tone that their department then goes, well, we can't do that because it will embarrass the minister. Um, you know, I often have information requests that I submit to defence trickle up into political offices when really they're just factual requests that should be released straight away. Um, the other problem too is um, the quality of journalism. Uh, there have been some shockingly researched stories um, with false allegations made against defence and members of the national security community, uh, and there hasn't been professional, professional censure for that. I mean, it doesn't happen a lot, but it has happened. Um, so there are some grounds to the wariness. So, but at the same time, a lot of the journalists I know have to be sort of unconventional in their techniques because they get nothing if they try and go in through the front door. So. Who's going to budge first? How are we going to dislodge this problem? It's a really tough issue. Well, there's now a sense, too, of punishment to the, the press, isn't there, with yeah. these awful uh, and ri just ridiculous laws that you can't talk about a botched operation, security operation, uh, things that the, the press have been absolutely free to report on. Yeah, part of the problem is it's, it gets Kafkaesque. I mean, mm. you can't talk about things that are secret, but how do you know that they're secret without, you know, I mean, you, you sort of get caught in, in, um, in uh, really strange twists of logic. Um, so it, it puts a dampener on any investigative journalism in that space. We have seen some good reporting in, 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 in this space as well in recent years, and it would be a pity to see that go away. It would just add to that climate of suspicion and, and uh, uh, anxiety, and, and people who might speak up when they've got genuine concerns will keep quiet rather than risking it. And... Um uh, you know, a great example of that sort of Kafkaesque uh, approach um, when the Chief of the Defence Force, uh, Air Marshal Mark Binskin, went to the meeting with Obama at Andrews Air Force Base the other week. Um, the White House put out a readout of what was said at the meeting. They put out a photo of who was at the meeting. And uh, Lisa Miller, the ABC's Washington correspondent, called Defence here and said, so did Binskin go to the meeting? And they wouldn't confirm for eight hours. <laughs> but I think this issue is going to pick up. I mean, this week next door you had Lachlan Murdoch talking about the issue of national security transparency, asking the question of whether Gallipoli mm. would have been a special intelligence operation. Mm. Um, you're starting to see Labor shift on this a little bit of, a little. you know, they wanted to minimise the differences between them and the government on national security. Now you're seeing Senator Faulkner sort of um, opening up a, a new discussion on this. So I think momentum will build. Mm. Um, so that uh, a discussion about ASIO and, and uh, intelligence culture, what about defence culture more generally, James? Because one of the things you argue about in, in your book is that we're so stuck in the sort of romance is not quite the word, but the attachment to the Gallipoli Anzac legend uh, and that, in fact, I only ever thought about this as a civilian, how stuck we, we seem to be on it. Uh, but, in fact, of course, it, it affects in really important ways the actual running of the military. How does that impact on a change like the decision now to send uh, aeroplanes to, you know, Syria and Iraq, but the general feeling... About, about the current sort of terrorism threat? Uh, that's, a, that's a big question. Um, and so, so if I understand what you're saying correctly, is sort of how, how does that sort of romantic mythologised view kind of impact does on, it affect it? Does on it public it... thinking or defence no, thinking? No, on defence thinking. Okay. Um, well, I, I think... A, let me kind of answer that indirectly, but um, and in a kind of ghoulish and macabre way, but... Um, I've been thinking through with some colleagues, you know, what would happen if an Australian pilot died in this conflict? How would we react? Uh, and the model we've set um, since Private Jacob Kovko died in 2005, I think it was, 2006, and the Prime Minister went to his funeral, is that we have these grand military funerals that um, all of a sudden the curtains of sort of lack of transparency on the Defence Department are lifted and we get this minute-by-minute -minute coverage of the ramp ceremony and the return the Prime Minister and the Opposition Leader and all the dignitaries imposing themselves on the family at the funeral. Um, nothing else happens in the political spotlight that day except for the funeral. Uh, and my argument is that, you know, that sort of 
makes people think, well, we're not winning because all we see is this sort of death and this futility and it plays into that sort of idea of Australians sacrificing themselves a long way from home. Um, there is a role for that kind of historical thinking, that kind of romantic thinking, um, because you do want to be part of a tradition of, of excellence and honour and duty, um, uh, but you need to be conscious that you don't let that affect too much of your thinking about war. I mean, if we, if we make the decision to send people to fight for us, we should be willing to risk... We should make sure that the cause we're sending them for is uh, one that we're willing to risk them dying in. And, and you know, we should, we should not fall over um, at every single death. We certainly need to honour the dead. We also need to honour the living. Uh, and, and, you know, there are lots of people who come back from really tough tours of duty. I mean, America's seeing this on a bigger scale than us, but I'm sure it applies here. And we don't always treat our veterans well, or maybe I should rephrase that. I'm not sure that we generally treat our veterans well. Um, and that's another thing we should be thinking about in this context. Well, that's, that's another thing you write about too, uh, that, you know, that we're much better at remembering the dead than sometimes looking after, after the living. And, I mean, more, more sort of... Broadly, I suppose, that, that Anzac uh, tradition in, in Australian culture more broadly, you know, does it, does it make it harder for politicians to explain to us what we presumably need to understand about what's going on with our security? Yeah, it does a little bit. I mean, you sort of saw this uh, in, the, um, in the discussions about getting into this conflict. So... Uh, there was a nervousness, I think, in the parliament to have a lot of detail on the table. Now, obviously, there's a need to be secretive about some tactical and operational intelligence stuff. Um, but when you read through, uh, I don't know whether anyone sort of had the time or the inclination, but to read through the statements made in the Federation Chamber about why we were doing this for IS, there was a lot of that kind of rhetoric, you know. It's not a lot of detail, not a lot of cold-headed... Um, weighing of the pros and cons and different options and different strategies. Um, it, it, wasn't very, it wasn't a very detailed discussion. And uh, our parliament now um, is the only Commonwealth country contributing forces to this fight who hasn't taken a vote on whether we should or not, which is kind of extraordinary when you think about it. So we, we're not willing to talk... This is a government that's got a huge majority in the lower house but is not willing to actually have that detailed discussion. Now, they don't have to... Um, they're not required under the Constitution to, but the reason why New Zealand, Canada uh, and the UK have all taken a vote is because the lesson we learnt from the last decade was if you don't build that political con consensus now, it's much harder to build it when the going gets tough, the battle is bogged down and you're seeing body bags come home. Well, I, I'm, I've got a, a quote from something you wrote recently that a Abbott has made one 800-word formal statement on Iraq to the Parliament in the past month. I think that was in September or August. And largely spoken to the country through the foregrounding of preferred journalists, doorstops and TV interviews. It sounds harsh when you quote it like that. <laughs> uh, it's a very anti-intellectual way of understanding and communicating what is an incredibly complicated problem. Yeah, it's funny that, you know, parliaments have been debating going to war for hundreds of years and we've sort of taken a retrograde mm. step. Um, now, part of the problem for that is that there is not a huge base of understanding on some of these issues, um, but that's not really a reason to not do it. I mean, and I was amazed. I saw uh, a senator who I, who I have a great deal of respect for and an analyst co-writing an op-ed saying, um, no, 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 we, we shouldn't bring this before the parliament. I mean, it's extraordinarily undemocratic. Does it surprise you, Greg, there hasn't been a great speech given or a, an explanatory something deep, something that, you know, you can point to? It's, it's, um, it's disappointing there hasn't been. James is right. It may be not surprising, but it's certainly disappointing. I can understand why President Obama hasn't gone to the House. I mean, Congress is quite dysfunctional and, and there's good reasons why he'd only get grief doing that. But we have bipartisan um, support for what we're doing. Um, it's good to say, let's have a show of hands, but before that, let's talk honestly about, at least in broad, big picture terms, about what we're trying to achieve, what the parameters are, um, you know, what the end goal is in, in, in general terms, why we're doing what we're doing. It may be sort of philosophical and, and sort of, you know, basically 
uh, fairly general rhetoric, but it would be good to have that statement and the show of hands. We'd get bipartisan support, but James is right. When the going gets tough, and it will get tough, um, then uh, we can look back and say, OK, we had this discussion, and we can return and, and discuss it again, but not having it at all is just not a very grown-up way of doing it, is it? Are either of you at all clued in as to what the end game is here? Uh, of course. We were briefed weeks ago. No, no I, look, I, I don't think so. I don't think anyone is. I mean, uh, mostly because no one knows what the strategy is on Syria, um, what's going to be the political strategy there. We're not going to try and topple Assad. Uh, we're not going to throw our support behind his opponents. So what is that going to look like? And until that's resolved, the end state in Iraq will be very fluid. Uh, and then we're dealing with a region that is a complete sea of troubles anyway. It's, you know, Libya, all the other countries you mentioned before, Greg, that, mm. uh, that all need solutions, not just mm. Iraq. So cheery. It's pretty <laughs> bleak, isn't it? A lot of known unknowns. Mm. Um, if you'd like to ask a question, you just have to put your hand up and if a microphone lands in it, start talking straight away. <laughs> Gentlemen at the back. Okay, there. who's first? Oh, we'll go down the back first and then... Can, and then can you hear me? Good. Thank you. Um, it's, everything I read and think about all this is that we have a deeply unpopular Prime Minister who's been beaten on every issue and now he sees an opportunity to step up, get in with the Americans and gain some popularity. Is that... Does anybody think that or is it just me? Maybe That's people could put up their hands if they think that. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting, um, isn't it? Yeah, I, I think that's a fairly cynical view. Um, <laughs> I, um, look, if you're, there's no doubt that uh, the Prime Minister would be paying attention to the way the polls have changed uh, since he um, has encountered these international security incidents. Um, I think, to be fair to the government, um, Julie Bishop, the foreign minister, has done some pretty extraordinary things, working some pretty incredible hours. Um, who would have thought that this government would, who, who opposed the UN Security Council bid would actually get so much out of being on the UN Security Council? Um, you're right. I mean, you need to pay attention to the domestic politics of all this, but I, I'm not sure that's the only explanation. Yeah, I, I agree with James. Um, to be fair to this government... Uh, this is a Prime Minister who's not particularly good at messaging. It's, it's like, you know, uh, watching an elephant in a tutu trying to ballet sometimes. Uh, but, but it doesn't mean that there aren't uh, uh, important things that go beyond domestic politics. And, and uh, cynicism is always a very useful tool in the uh, political analysis toolbox, but it's not always, it's not always the right one to use. And uh, I, I think that these are difficult times when difficult decisions have to be made. And... Um, it would be better if we had this conversation about why we're doing what we're doing and, and we better we, we, we changed the way that we uh, talk across the whole of government and across our agencies. But it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily mean that we're just... We've got a Prime Minister who's trying to boost his popularity because I'm not sure that it's working for him. Um, and I think, I think perhaps it's easier to see... I mean, James, you're right when you talk about Julie Bishop. The Foreign Minister, I think, makes it easier for us to see um, sort of statesmanship at work. I mean, she's... Uh, They've both come into difficult circumstances they wouldn't wish. Um, she, in particular, has done a very good job of uh, demonstrating uh, why we have to do what we're doing and uh, and getting on with the business of of, of you know building international cooperation on this. Uh, we, you know, to go back to the original discussion, what we're dealing with with Islamic State is a, a movement that's quarter a century and more in the making and it, it affects us quite directly, and it's not gonna go away if we close our eyes and, and, and sort of count to 100. Um, and we do have to respond to it in some ways, and I think part of the response uh, needs to be military response to go back to end point. Um, I think everyone would agree that driving Islamic State out of the cities it occupies along the Euphrates and the Tigris is part of what we're looking for, but then it has to be backed up with a, a stable, uh, government in Baghdad that governs for all of Iraq and for all Iraqis and, and delivers good governance would probably have to come to a real politic uh, situation with um, Assad where he's left in a, a rump state around Damascus, not because we like him or we can work with him, but because he's got real support there and, and no one can dislodge him. Um, and then putting Syria back together is going to be a tough, a, 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 a tough job. And 
I, I think that we're doing the right thing by trying to engage in this, but it's so uncertain and um, so fraught and so many things could go wrong at any point that we should at least be honest about saying uh, we're just doing something necessary but difficult and here's the challenges we face. And, and I think your point about, you know, we can't just put our head down and try and ride this out. I mean, we're a country that's connected to the world and has to be connected to the world. So problems there do affect us. Mm. Thank you. I think both um, Greg and James have taken great care to dance around criticising the government and, and perhaps rather too daintily, I think, really. I think the case for being there... Uh, and reacting in the way that we have has not been made at all. Um, I wanted to make two points. From the point of view of being a former infantry officer in Vietnam, and secondly, as someone at a government level who's been involved with commemoration and um, uh, memorials and the, I guess, the upping the ante on remembering veterans and so on and so forth. My first point is that it's, it's parallel to what you both are talking about, but it is really more about the, the reason why we are there. And in the media and in, indeed, your discussion today, no one talks about the underlying, I think, what the real reason is, it's about security of energy and, and the supply of oil. And so the interests of the United States and of Saudi Arabia are really, really at paramount here. Whether a new caliphate uh, organises itself All in right. the north of Iraq uh, is, is one thing. Um, so I suppose I offer it as a comment um, and I don't think it's at all cynical to say that this is a strong, has a strong domestic All uh, right, let's, let's have the going. guest respond to, to that. Thank you. Um, so the question of oil, absolutely. It's, it's a factor. Um, Australia uh, relies, I mean, the, the, the petrol you put in your cars, 100% of that comes here on a ship, mostly from Singapore, uh, Korea, Taiwan. Uh, most of that delivered in crude form from, refi uh, from, from uh, companies in, in the Middle East. Um, and, you know, there's a whole narrative about, you know, the role of oil and security and all that sort of stuff. Uh, but... It is a strategic factor, and, it, and you have to consider it. Um, that's one reason why the Middle East is significant. Interestingly, um, becoming more significant for Australia is, as our sort of need for imported oil grows, and less significant for the US as their uh, energy independence grows. Um, but it's part of the mix. But, I mean, the sort of narrative we're there just for the oil, it's a little bit too simplistic. I mean, if there was no oil, yet you still had uh, a group um, wantonly killing people, using force to gain territory, we would still have an interest in stopping that. Yeah, I mean, I mean, James is, of course, completely right that this has always been, energy has always been a factor in thinking about these issues. But it, the, the odd irony about the current situation, late 2014, is that um, uh, because of what's happened with, with shale oil and with fracking, um, there's actually not the, the, the pressing need that there used to be. I mean, a decade ago, this was a much more sort of clear-cut argument. Now, actually, the US particularly could ride this out, and, and it's got other options. Um, for us, the, there are immediate needs, and that's, that's some concern, but I think it's actually a receding point to consider. And I think we've come to realise that uh, we may have initially responded to the region because of concerns about energy, but now we realise that it actually... It's, there's a lot more than energy riding on this, and, and um, the fact that Islamic State and related movements project their appeal um, uh, via the internet, via social media, uh, into uh, the lives of our young people uh, means that uh, there's a direct interest for us uh, in, in terms of whether these nations can become healthy and stable. It's, it's, it's much more than energy at stake here. And there's a surprising amount of Australians that live in the region too. So mm. Dubai is home to a lot of Australians. Um, you know, obviously there's a lot of Australians uh, who have lived or go back to Lebanon as well. So, I mean, we're tied in in a number of ways. Mm. Yeah. Um, first, I think, uh, James, if um, no oil, no energy in the Middle East, I don't think we'll have this war. That's my understanding. Uh, Greg, I don't know what you, um, your definition of civil war in Syria 
if 40% plus of the fighters are outside, they're coming from outside, from 85 countries, so I don't know if we're still calling the, what, what's happening in Syria a civil war. Uh, sorry, like I'm going to have a few um, questions, but uh, I might, mainly... Um, I might just leave you with, it, with that one, if you, if you don't mind, because we haven't actually talked yet about yeah. the people Can going... Just one, I, OK, one, quickly. Okay. Yeah. We need a question the, the other thing is, regarding the ISIS, um, I don't know if our intelligence failed for the last 25 years to recognize that, you know, uh, coming of ISIS, or that was a plan, because we know that, I mean, we have no um, objection or uh, no one doesn't agree that Saudi Arabia, Qatar, Turkey, they were the main uh, countries who funded and trained ISIS. And if their border was secured, I don't think we will have ISIS now in Syria and Iraq. Thank you. There's so much there, and we, we actually do have to finish it up. But can I ask, because we, we didn't talk about um, the people, uh, you know, the Australians going uh, to Syria and Iraq to fight, and from many other countries as well, as you said, is, I mean, this is not brand new either, is it? But it's getting a level of attention uh, that I think, you know, we haven't really seen before. Is it, is it significant? Well, it is brand new in one sense. I mean, back in the 80s, we had um, thousands of foreign fighters go and, and, and join with the, uh, the Afghan uh, as, as so-called mujahideen. Most of them actually didn't do a lot of fighting. Uh, and uh, groups like uh, nascent al-Qaeda sort of said, your mission here is to train and go home and fight. Um, back then, it's hard to believe there was no internet, much less social media. Travel was hard. Uh, it took a long time to get there and you didn't see much action. Today, we have this unique situation and it's come out of what's happened in Syria, uh, that things are being reported real time via the internet and particularly via social media. Uh, people are chatting with their friends, they can get on it. We've seen tragically just how easy a couple of kids can get on a flight out of Sydney or Melbourne and end up on the front line in Syria um, with, with very few barriers stopping them from doing so. And that for, for kids can be very attractive. Um, but it means we've now seen 16,000 foreign fighters go into the region, mostly through uh, across the Turkish border into Syria, but now going into Iraq over the last three years. And that's something we've never seen before. It's happened much faster than what happened in Afghanistan. It's involving uh, it's sort of global networks in a way that uh, what happened in Afghanistan uh, didn't happen as quickly or on the same scale. And it's going to have consequences that we've never seen before. That and the fact we've got this terrorist group with a quasi-state. So it's, it is a new set of circumstances. And we're right to be very worried about it. And I think that part of the reason that there was an intelligence failure in as much as um, sort of analysis wasn't coming to recognise this threat was because it, it's so hard to get your head around that, you know, that this would be... If we'd said this 12 months ago, some people would have said, look, you're exaggerating. You know, you're, you're sort of making things up. Um, in hindsight, it was all very clear, but I can understand why uh, President Obama told 60 Minutes last month that um, you know, we got it wrong, because it's easy to get that. It, it, it's something bigger and faster than we, we saw coming. Mm. And the, the foreign fighter thing is really interesting. I mean, the, the depth of training that these people are getting is, I think, more intense than we've seen mm. before. The depth of military training and urban training and explosives training and propaganda training and even recruiting training um, and the scale. I mean... 100 Australian foreign fighters, or 60, or whatever the number is today, I think it's 70 they said this week. Uh, it doesn't sound like much, right? But 70 people trained in explosives, in communicating with each other in ways that can't be detected by authorities, um, with Australian passports, able to travel without visas, uh, in most countries in Europe, uh, to the US, that's pretty scary. That's and a business, isn't it? Like you said at the very beginning. That's, that's a pretty big scary. business. And, and, and it, as, as an Australian government, if you let 70 people come back from that part of the world with that training and didn't monitor them round the clock, you would be completely negligent. And keeping tabs on 70 people is a huge task. It doesn't sound like much, but keeping a watch on 70 people for a year, that is a huge task. And we're talking about how expensive the bombs uh, we're dropping in, in Iraq are, but imagine how expensive it is to keep surveillance on that many people for a year. It's huge money. And it's one of the reasons, by the way, why there is a, a legitimate need to change current legislation. Um, but 
because we have all this security, this uh, secrecy about intelligence and, 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 and this field in general, people don't understand how very hard it is to do what needs to be done. We've had dozens of people been to Syria, Iraq and come back. Not a single one mm. has been charged. It's very hard to, to get evidence you can present in the court of law, and we want mm. this to be processed through an open court of law. Um, but at the, at the moment, it's just very, very hard to do what, what needs to be Which done. Which is where that community dialogue becomes presumably the most important resource you have. Yeah, if we depend upon putting a lot more money into uh, intelligence agencies and, and, and engaging in massive surveillance, um, then we've really got it the wrong way around. I mean, that, some of that has to happen, but we actually need a system where we engage on a case basis with individuals who have been and come back, maybe not charged, maybe some of them should have been charged, but we can't do that. Others who have had their passports taken, perhaps 70 now have had their passports withheld, um, 120 plus who are supporting them, um, and the 70 who are there at the moment, 60, 70, many will come back. We need to do this as a whole of society, working with uh, their families, their you know, particular community groups, um, providing a whole range of resources. It's not just a question, we, we, we just can't even do the surveillance thing. I mean, 24-7 uh, surveillance is incredibly expensive and once you get beyond a handful of people, it can't be sustained. Mm. And what do we do with this, you know, this, this guy from Bankstown who's been fronting the propaganda mm. videos? Mm. What do we do with him when we come back? I mean, a there teenager. Was, mm. I read an interesting article this week on the Danish approach to mm. this, which is, you know, sort of focus on rehabilitation. Um, I don't know what the right answer is there, but, you know, how do you get that kid back to his parents mm. and make sure he doesn't do anything bad? That's a really, really tough issue. Mm. Yeah, and of course, he, he went off with his 16-year-old friend uh, who, uh, who, when they tweeted that they were, or, or sent a message that they were crossing from Turkey into Syria, his friend's father went and retrieved that young guy. And that's, you know, that, thankfully, that, that happened. But you'd, you'd hope you could get uh, um, Abdullah uh, Elmir out of there before he gets involved in fighting. And if that were possible, you'd then say, look, let's, let's try and get him back into society because um, this is just madness that uh, a, a, a kid ends up on the front line. It, it couldn't have happened with Afghanistan, it couldn't have happened with other situations, um, but uh, Islamic State and other groups are using kids like this to, you know, as, as instruments in their machine. And the Danes are saying when we get indications of our nationals wanting to come home and having real misgivings about what they, the reality they find, we've got to work with them in doing that. There's calls to do that in Britain, and at some stage we're going to have to look at that here as well. Well, that will be interesting because it requires a communication, a level of communication that so far, I mean, that's what I've got out of the conversation tonight, is that the communication needs to, you know, in every way, to be telling, talking to people, explaining. Uh, really, really interesting. Our time is up. I'm really sorry if you didn't get to ask um, a question. Uh, it's been really, really great to have you both here, please thank Professor Greg Barton and James Brown. <laughs>